Chapter 2. Christ Will Not Break the Bruised Reed In pursuing his calling, Christ will not break the bruised reed, nor quench the smoking flax, in which more is meant than spoken. For he will not only not break nor quench, but he will cherish those with whom he so deals. Christ's Dealings with the Bruised Reed Physicians, though they put their patients to much pain, will not destroy nature, but raise it up by degrees. Surgeons will lance and cut, but not dismember. A mother who has a sick and self-willed child will not therefore cast it away. And shall there be more mercy in the stream than in the spring? Shall we think there is more mercy in ourselves than in God, who plants the affection of mercy in us? But for further declaration of Christ's mercy to all bruised reeds, consider the comfortable relationships he has taken upon himself of husband, shepherd, and brother, which he will discharge to the utmost. Shall others by his grace fulfill what he calls them unto, and not he who, out of his love, has taken upon him these relationships, so thoroughly founded upon his father's assignment and his own voluntary undertaking? Consider the names he has borrowed from the mildest creatures, such as lamb and hen, to show his tender care. Consider his very name, Jesus, a Savior, given to him by God himself. Consider his office answerable to his name, which is that he should bind up the brokenhearted. Isaiah 61, 1. At his baptism the Holy Ghost rested on him in the shape of a dove, to show that he should be a dove-like, gentle mediator. See the gracious way he executes his offices. As a prophet, he came with blessing in his mouth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Matthew 5, 3 and invited those to come to him whose hearts suggested most exceptions against themselves. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Matthew 11:28. How did his heart yearn when he saw the people as sheep having no shepherd? Matthew 9:36. He never turned any back again that came to him, though some went away of themselves. He came to die as a priest for his enemies. In the days of his flesh he dictated a form of prayer unto his disciples, and put petitions unto God into their mouths, and his spirit to intercede in their hearts. He shed tears for those that shed his blood, and now he makes intercession in heaven for weak Christians, standing between them and God's anger. He is a meek king. He will admit mourners into his presence, a king of poor and afflicted persons. As he has beams of majesty, so he has a heart of mercy and compassion. He is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. Why was he tempted, but that he might succor them that are tempted, Hebrews 2, 18? What mercy may we not expect from so gracious a mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5, who took our nature upon him, that he might be gracious? He is a physician good at all diseases, especially at the binding up of a broken heart. He died that he might heal our souls with a plaster of his own blood, and by that death save us, which we were the procurers of ourselves by our own sins. And has he not the same heart in heaven? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? cried the head in heaven, when the foot on earth was trodden on. Acts 9 4. His advancement has not made him forget his own flesh. Though it has freed him from passion, yet not from compassion towards us. The lion of the tribe of Judah will only tear in pieces those that will not have him rule over them. Luke 19.14 He will not show his strength against those who prostrate themselves before him. For ourselves. 1. What should we learn from this but to come boldly to the throne of grace? Hebrews 4.16 In all our grievances. Shall our sins discourage us, when he appears there only for sinners? Are you bruised? Be of good comfort, he calls you. Conceal not your wounds. Open all before him, and take not Satan's counsel. Go to Christ, although trembling, as the poor woman who said, If I may but touch his garment. Matthew 9.21 We shall be healed, and have a gracious answer. Go boldly to God in our flesh. He is flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone for this reason, that we might go boldly to him. Never fear to go to God, since we have such a mediator with him, 
who is not only our friend, but our brother and husband. Well might the angel proclaim from heaven, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Luke 2.10 Well might the apostle stir us up to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Rejoice. Philippians 4.4 4. Paul was well advised upon what grounds he did it. Peace and joy are two main fruits of Christ's kingdom. Let the world be as it will. If we cannot rejoice in the world, yet we may rejoice in the Lord. His presence makes any condition comfortable. Be not afraid, says he to his disciples, when they were afraid, as if they had seen a ghost. It is I, Matthew 14:27, as if there were no cause of fear where he was present. 2. Let this support us when we feel ourselves bruised. Christ's way is first to wound, then to heal. No sound, whole soul shall ever enter into heaven. Think when in temptation, Christ was tempted for me. According to my trials will be my graces and comforts. If Christ be so merciful as not to break me, I will not break myself by despair, nor yield myself over to the roaring lion. Satan to break me in pieces. 3. See the contrary disposition of Christ on the one hand and Satan and his instruments on the other. Satan sets upon us when we are weakest, as Simeon and Levi upon the Shechemites when they were sore. Genesis 34:25. But Christ will make up in us all the breaches which sin and Satan have made. He binds up the brokenhearted. Isaiah 61:1. As a mother is tenderest to the most diseased and weakest child, so does Christ most mercifully incline to the weakest. Likewise, he puts an instinct into the weakest things to rely upon something stronger than themselves for support. The vine stays itself upon the elm, and the weakest creatures often have the strongest shelters. The consciousness of the church's weakness makes her willing to lean on her beloved and to hide herself under his wing. Who are the bruised reeds? But how shall we know whether we are such as may expect mercy? Answer 1. By the bruised here is not meant those that are brought low only by crosses, but such as, by them, are brought to see their sin, which bruises most of all. When conscience is under the guilt of sin, then every judgment brings a report of God's anger to the soul, and all lesser troubles run into this great trouble of conscience for sin. As all corrupt humors run to the diseased and bruised part of the body, and as every creditor falls upon the debtor when he is once arrested, so when conscience is once awakened, all former sins and present crosses join together to make the bruise the more painful. Now he that is thus bruised will be content with nothing but with mercy from him who has bruised him. He has wounded, and he must heal. Hosea 6 1. The Lord who has bruised me deservedly for my sins must bind up my heart again. 2. Again, a man truly bruised judges sin the greatest evil and the favor of God the greatest good. 3. He would rather hear of mercy than of a kingdom. 4. He has poor opinions of himself and thinks that he is not worth the earth he treads on. 5. Towards others he is not censorious, as being taken up at home, but is full of sympathy and compassion to those who are under God's hand. 6. He thinks that those who walk in the comforts of God's Spirit are the happiest men in the world. 7. He trembles at the word of God, Isaiah 66, 2, and honors the very feet of those blessed instruments that bring peace unto him, Romans 10:15. 8. He is more taken up with the inward exercises of a broken heart than with formality, and is yet careful to use all sanctified means to convey comfort. But how shall we come to this state of mind? Answer. First, we must conceive of bruising, either as a state into which God brings us, or as a duty to be performed by us. Both are here meant. We must join with God in bruising ourselves. When He humbles us, let us humble ourselves, and not stand out against him, for then he will redouble his strokes. Let us justify Christ in all his chastisements, knowing that all his dealing towards us is to cause us to return into our own hearts. 
His work in bruising tends to our work in bruising ourselves. Let us lament our own perversity and say, Lord, what a heart have I that needs all this, that none of this could be spared. We must lay siege to the hardness of our own hearts and aggravate sin all we can. We must look on Christ, who is bruised for us, look on Him whom we have pierced with our sins. But all directions will not prevail unless God by His Spirit convinces us deeply, setting our sins before us and driving us to a standstill. Then we will cry out for mercy. Conviction will breed contrition, and this leads to humiliation. Therefore desire God that He would bring a clear and strong light into all the corners of our souls, and accompany it with a spirit of power to lay our hearts low. A set measure of bruising of ourselves cannot be prescribed, but it must be so far as, one, that we may prize Christ above all, and see that a Savior must be had, and two, that we reform that which is amiss, though it be to the cutting off of our right hand, or pulling out of our right eye. There is a dangerous slighting of the work of humiliation, some alleging this for a pretense, for their casual dealing with their own hearts, that Christ will not break the bruised reed. But such must know that every sudden terror and short grief is not that which makes us bruised reeds. Not a little bowing down our heads like a bulrush, Isaiah 58, 5, but a working our hearts to such a grief as will make sin more odious to us than punishment, until we offer a holy violence against it. Else, favoring ourselves, we make work for God to bruise us, and for sharp repentance afterwards. It is dangerous, I confess, in some cases, with some spirits, to press too much and too long this bruising, because they may die under the wound and burden before they be raised up again. Therefore it is good in mixed assemblies to mingle comfort, that every soul may have its due portion. But if we have this for a foundation truth, that there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us, there can be no danger in thorough dealing. It is better to go bruised to heaven than sound to hell. Therefore let us not take off ourselves too soon, nor pull off the plaster before the cure be wrought, but keep ourselves under this work till sin be the sourest and Christ the sweetest of all things. And when God's hand is upon us in any way, it is good to divert our sorrow for other things to the root of all, which is sin. Let our grief run most in that channel, that as sin bred grief, so grief may consume sin. But are we not bruised unless we grieve more for sin than we do for punishment? Answer. Sometimes our grief from outward grievances may lie heavier upon the soul than grief for God's displeasure, because, in such cases, the grief works upon the whole man, both outward and inward, and has nothing to support it but a little spark of faith. This faith, by reason of the violent impression of the grievance, is suspended in the exercises of it. This is most felt in sudden distresses which come upon the soul as a torrent or land flood and especially in bodily sicknesses which, by reason of the sympathy between the soul and the body, work upon the soul so far as to hinder not only the spiritual but often the natural acts. Therefore, James wishes us in affliction to pray ourselves, but in case of sickness, to send for the elders, James 5.14. These may, as those in the Gospels, offer up to God in their prayers the sick person who is unable to present his own case. Hereupon God admits of such a plea from the sharpness and bitterness of the grievance, as in David, Psalm 6. The Lord knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust, Psalm 103:14, that our strength is not the strength of steel. This is a branch of his faithfulness to us as his creatures, whence he is called a faithful creator, 1 Peter 4:19. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, 1 Corinthians 10.13 There were certain commandments which the Jews called the hedges of the law. So as to fence men off from cruelty, God commanded that they should not take the dam with the young, nor see the kid in his mother's milk, Exodus 23.19, nor muzzle the mouth of the ox, 1 Corinthians 9.9 9. Does God take care of beasts and not of his more noble creature? 
and therefore we ought to judge charitably of the complaints of God's people, which are wrung from them in such cases. Job had the esteem with God of a patient man, notwithstanding those passionate complaints. Faith overborne for the present will gain ground again, and grief for sin, although it comes short of grief for misery in terms of violence, yet it goes beyond it in constancy, as a running stream fed with a spring holds out when a sudden swelling brook fails. For the concluding of this point, and our encouragement to a thorough work of bruising, and patience under God's bruising of us, let all know that none are fitter for comfort than those that think themselves furthest off. Men, for the most part, are not lost enough in their own feeling for a Savior. A holy despair in ourselves is the ground of true hope. In God the fatherless find mercy. Hosea 14.3 if men were more fatherless, they should feel more God's fatherly affection from heaven. For the God who dwells in the highest heavens dwells likewise in the lowest soul. Isaiah 57:15. Christ's sheep are weak sheep, and lacking in something or other. He therefore applies himself to the necessities of every sheep. He seeks that which was lost, and brings again that which was driven out of the way, and binds up that which was broken and strengthens the weak, Ezekiel 34.16. His tenderest care is over the weakest. The lambs he carries in his bosom, Isaiah 40.11. He says to Peter, Feed my lambs, John 21.15. He was most familiar and open to troubled souls. How careful he was that Peter and the rest of the apostles should not be too much dejected after his resurrection. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, Mark 16.7. Christ knew that guilt of their unkindness in leaving of him had dejected their spirits. How gently did he endure the unbelief of Thomas, and stooped so far unto his weakness as to suffer him to thrust his hand into his side.